And this is our fourth, fifth event we had. I think it's our fifth event. I can't remember because it seems like we've done so many. And the Lebanon Museum Foundation was created about barely a year ago uh, from the city council wanting to create a museum. And so we started off as a committee for the city and then we became a nonprofit foundation. And that was last year, right about this time, maybe it was in September, October. And so now for a year, we've been working on gathering things from collections. We actually have several things in our collection. One of our board members is a former Nevada State uh, Museum curator. And so we actually have a curator on our board of directors. We have a great board of directors. Linda Zedrick here is on our board. Uh, we have Wayne Dykstra, who's on our board here, the Geology Society all around town. And Kendra, is she here? Uh, Kendra, the, the Library Services Director, she is also on our board. Um, we have quite a few other people that are really interested, and Jeff is now on our board too, so quite a few people that are really interested in the history of Lebanon and making this museum real. We have we have a computer, we have a database, so we put things in, we're collecting things. We're trying not to collect too much because we don't have a lot of space. The library is loaning us a space back here where we can store our stuff. So that's our big thing right now is we're trying to get money to get a building and have a place that's a permanent home for our museum. We've been looking all around all the buildings. Um, if you know of anybody that has a building or even, even an office space at this point so we could get settled and get some things done as opposed to being in the back part of the library and get away from them so that we're not, you know, filling up the library with museum stuff. So anyways, um, if you're interested in donating, there's some information there, some pamphlets. You can throw a couple bucks in there if you want. Uh, you can contact us later. But if you do know of anybody that has a building or is interested in helping us out in that area, please let us know. Um, we have done several of these events. We started off uh, with Tony Fonqua from the um, uh, from the Forestry Service, and he came and talked about the American Indians in the area. And it was really an interesting talk. That was our first talk last year, October, I believe it was. And we've had uh, Bob Bay Adams talk about their uh, pharmacy, and I, I missed that one, but I got to see it on video, and it was awesome. But it was packed, and all kinds of neat artifacts out there. Um, and we've got this one coming uh, with Jeff tonight about the mills. This is what our museum is going to be. It is going to be something that presents information to everyone. Kids, we're going to have kids coming into the museum from schools so that they learn about our history because it's going away fast. And as we're finding, we're getting people contacted and people are moving out of the building <coughs> or going into nursing homes because they're just at that age where the stuff is just getting they don't really need it or want it or know what to do with it. So we're a place that we can take stuff, just not big stuff right now. So if you've got small papers or newspaper things, we can take those, but right now, any of the big items, we've got to wait for a little bit until we get it built. So without further ado, I'm going to have Linda introduce our speaker. Uh, Jeff has, has been a great guy around town, and he's on our board, and I'm really proud to have him on our board, and I thank you, Jeff. Uh, and so, well, let's let you. Well, I think Paul has introduced our speaker. But our speaker is Jeff Smith. He grew up here in Lebanon, and he, um, almost by accident, <coughs> has become an archivist of Lebanon's photographs and, and a steward of Lebanon history. And he will explain more to you about that. Please welcome Jeff. I want to start with a disclaimer. I am not an expert on Lebanon mills. By any means whatsoever. What I have is a large collection of historical Lebanon artifacts. Photos, machines, just elements that have been donated or forgotten over the years, purchased at estate sales and antique stores. Any chance I can to save a little bit of Lebanon history, I do. I put it in a box and I store it. When Lebanon gets a museum, good day for me, because all my stuff <laughs> gets passed on to somebody else and I'll have more room for activities. So what I've got are uh, collections of photos. A lot of these came from John Egan. So John Egan was a friend of mine. Um, I knew him through the church and through the community. Uh, and when he passed away, a lot of his stuff came to me. Um, as a photographer, <coughs> working at the newspaper, um, it, was, it was a good fit. 
Most of what came to me, we labeled, boxed, and we put away. I think I have somewhere in the ballpark of 10,000 photos from John Egan, covering from the 19, late 1930s all the way up to 1990, I believe it was, when he stopped taking photos. that but it's my phone. <coughs> um, so I've got a lot of those photos. Um, I also have collections from the Lebanon Express. So I used to work for the Lebanon Express as a photographer. I was the last photographer for the Lebanon Express. Um, and so I have photos collected through that through the years, original negatives. And then once you start collecting these things, people start dropping stuff off. Whether you like it or not, somebody shows up and here have some photos, have this, and most of the time that, that's a transaction. I have these, I don't know anything about them, can you find a home for them? I'll never turn down any Lebanon artifacts, but at that point I know just as much as the person handing it off. And then it's through events like this, meeting people who work at the mills, uh, recognize people in the photos, I learn a little bit more and a little bit more. Uh, at the same time, people say, oh, I recognize this building, I share that information, and I find out I'm, it's completely wrong. It's not correct at all, that's not the real building, so if anything I say is incorrect, call me out on it, or else I'll just keep spreading the false information. Um, even this week, somebody brought me uh, a centennial newspaper, the Crown Zeller Bank uh, from 1870 to 1970. Uh, amazing piece of, of Lebanon history. I don't know if there's many of these left. This has huge historical significance to Lebanon for one reason. Uh, this page right here is, to my knowledge, the only known copy of the very first Lebanon Express. Issue number one from the 1870s. This came up missing about 30 years ago. My guess is when they took that newspaper to make this copy, the original got lost or destroyed. So this may be the only original copy of the first page of the first Lebanon Express. I have number two and on, but the number one has been missing. We've never been able to find it. I've never seen it until somebody brought this in. And so it's a little things like that that we see the importance of. That may be the only copy. The articles are readable, so somebody can look at that, transpose it, and read the first article ever written in Lebanon in the 18, I think it was the 1870s or 1890s. Um, after the presentation, there's stuff up here you can come and look at, just like anything old. It's valuable, but not valuable, it's um, uh, fragile. So you can look at these items. Uh, the more fragile pieces like this, I have about 10 copies of this, so this is the one that I let people touch. If it gets ruined, this is the only one I'll let go out to people. Um, but I think people need to see this. Again, another centennial. Um, this is Lebanon Centennial, 1947. So those pieces there. We're talking about mills today. Here's an appraisal and inventory book from 1922, appraising everything inside the mill. Every stack of lumber, every piece of machinery, all hand typed with hand notes. So it's, it's maybe three or four hundred pages of inventory of the entire crown mill. Also what's interesting or neat about this too is there's original maps of the mill identifying all the buildings and reference mark points. So fun things to look at there. Uh, when I go through the slides uh, we're going to touch really on um, three or four of the different mill sites. Uh, most of what I have is pre-1948. So uh, the mills that were, came after 1948, I don't have photos of. Um, so we're looking at Crown Zellerback, or Crown Lamont at the time, and we're also looking at Cascade. We're gonna see Douglas Fir product, because that headed out towards Waterloo. Um, and then I've got one, I can hardly, I never remember the name. It is uh, Mountain States Power Company which is using the mill products to produce power. I don't know where it was at. I see people nodding, they recognize it, so we've got photos of that. I don't know where that mill was stationed, but we've got photos here. So 
Any questions real quick before I get started? All right, we're going to look at Crown, Willamette Paper. I try to keep these slides in order so that I, I know what I'm talking about. Crown, Willamette Paper was located just over there behind where the hospital is today. Uh, the mill site is still there. Some of the, the landscape elements, including the railroad tracks, still exist today. So if you see the railroad tracks, where they're at there is also where they're at in these photos. Uh, this structure here, this water dam, parts of that are still visible as well. So if you drive over Industrial Way, across the bridge, you'll still see parts of that. Everything else was cleared and burned down. Um, again, most of these photos, every photo here I think was taken pre-1948. A lot of these are going to be in the 30s and 40s in relation to Crown. Hey Jeff. Yeah. On, on that picture, could you go back to that picture real quick? Yeah. That little waterway area there on the left, is that the one that used to have the big water wheel right across from LBCC and the hospital there? I believe, and, yes. And they that decommissioned is, that all, it's just kind of a pond right now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so we'll yeah. that way, the main road came in mm -hmm. right here, and then you followed the, it around. Because there's only, there's only three buildings left. There's only three buildings that exist of Crown Teller Uh Like you said, they're on Industrial Way, right there across, right there across the street, this way from the hospital. There's those two gray buildings there that exist from Crown Teller back, and then the one on the left, uh, which is at Medical Supply, that used to be the office. Excellent. And that's the only three buildings that do exist. And, and what we're looking at here is part of the old mill. Yes. So the old mill started in 1870 and then was expanded on and expanded on through the years. Um, little, now we're getting older, so here we are in the early 1910s. Uh, you can see how tiny it was compared to our first shop. So, well, it looks like they reduced it in size. So, 1910, <laughs> you can see the main tower, me. and then the mill is it built up around it. The tower is still present. There's the straw. Collection, zip lines, processes for producing at the mill. Again, we're here, we're about 1915, 1916. Um, you can see how important the mills were to Lebanon. This is, this is what the Lebanon's economy was built on. One of the sawmills heading up and down the rivers. Again, collecting this one is referenced as number 16 building, new dam at Sawmill Lebanon. Uh, here we are again, early 1900s, building construction on the Crown Willamette site. So what's interesting is anything that we have uh, 1930 and earlier is going to be tied to Crown. <coughs> then what happens is Cascade comes in and then most of all the photos follow that because Crown is now not obsolete, but it's, it's second. It's old, it's dated. Um, and later, the crown actually became a test bed for the larger mills in the area. So whenever a new product needed or a new machinery needed to be tested, they'd take it to crown because it was small, and if there was a downtime of a day or a week, it had little impact on production. So they would use that equipment, test it there. If it worked well, then they would implement it at the other mills. So through the years, there's a lot of change inside Crown because anytime something new came out it's easier to shut down a small mill than a big one. Older photos again. Different angles. And a lot of these photos, if you look close, you can see Horse and carriages or horse and wagons still moving a lot of the product around. Uh, 
part of the dam works uh, and the lift gates for controlling water flow around the mill. So this is just when you come in on industrial way, part of this bridge structure is still there today. Here's another angle. So over in this area here is where the hospital is now. Now we're going to start looking inside the mills. We're going to start to see some of the people, um, what it was like to work there, the environments. So as we move inside the mills, we've now moved over to Cascade. Uh, so part of what these photos represent. Photos, taking photos back then, was time consuming and expensive. So it's not like today, you grab your phone, you go and you take 100 photos, no big deal. Most photos, in order for them to be taken, they had to be contracted work which is where John Egan came in as a professional photographer. So John didn't go out and just take these photos because he liked to take photos. He was paid to come out and photograph the mills. And most of the photos that you see, you gotta realize that, that somebody had to hire them to come out and do that. They didn't go out there just to take the photos. This was paid work at the time. So when we see a lot of these photos, yes, they're gonna be staged to make the mill look really good, they're going to show all the highlights of the mills, all the prizes, the awards, how fun it is to work there. Um, but you still at the same time get a feel for what the mill was like. But every one of these, again, is going to be a contracted photo where the photographer comes out, sets the scene, gets everybody lined up, and takes a photo. This is probably a three second exposure. So this gentleman had to stand here and not move for three seconds while the flash takes place. So photos where stuff's moving, you're going to see big blur, especially when they got the, the plywood or the, the pulp going through the machines. Um, but again, these are going to come out to stage photos. Um, that's every one of these, any that you come across, that's how it's going to work. Uh, in today's dollars, it equal out to about $5 a photo. So every time you took a photo, $5, and there's 20 to 35 minutes of processing for each one. So a lot of love and a lifetime commitment went to provide these photos. So the ones we're seeing of Cascade, Cascade hired John to come out, and they contracted him to do a whole series of photos over a period of three years. So here we're in 1947, and we're at the Cascade Mill. So the Cascade is located out across from where the Walmart is today, uh, where the lakes are. And so we're going to see a lot of, a lot of that. Uh, landmarks we're going to be looking for are the uh, water towers, which are still present. So you can kind of use those as a reference to see where you're at and what angle you're looking at. Did Cascade become the champion mill? <sighs> so yes, Cascade, um, Cascade Willamette, Champion, uh, we had Bowman Mill, um, Crown Willamette, Crown Zellerback. So through all the years, uh, the mills had a lot of different names, yeah. Uh, this was a new office building that was added at the end of the mill. Uh, this is 1948. <coughs> and so we're in the plywood mill. cars and the train. So safety pot of gold, days without injury, there's prizes available, people would win refrigerators and appliances. Um, see the 
time card sheets on the wall in there. Number of accidents, six. <coughs> second exposures, um, so he had to stand there for three seconds, yet the product still moves. So we've got the lakes over here, the tower still stands, we saw earlier the new structure, the new office that was being built, which is seen right there. Jeff, are you aware that it was Evans plywood when it first came to town? I had heard that, but I don't know the dates of when. It was about 1940. Okay. So it started as Evans and then Cascade bought it out. And then Sears. <coughs> and Champion. And... Uh, we got a picture of Evans plywood. Oh, excellent. Anyway, it's dated uh, March 15, 1941. 41? Okay. So by 1946, it had been bought out by Cascade. So we kind of get a, a time frame there. So Evans, at least in 1941. Separators made from wood? Yeah, they were. <clears throat> so here's a shot of the battery separator.
what we're looking at here is the uh, mountain power. So this was a power plant. Again, I'm not sure where the location was. Um, I have the original negatives, and it just says mountain power site, mill site. That looks like Ridgeway behind it. it looks, yeah, it looks like Ridgeway. It looks closer, so I don't know kind of where, where, how far down. Dress code for work was overalls, no shirt, and a fedora. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing upper management. <laughs> So this is Douglas Fur Products. That was in Lebanon? Uh, I headed out towards Waterloo. And thanks to your map, I know, know right where it's at. It's about a mile to the east of Waterloo. card sheets. Uh, we're going to see a couple different photos. Uh, I'll get to it. I'll kind of explain what, the, the, what I see the importance of them. So here are pay stubs. So when, you're, when you come to your paychecks. So employee number one through at least 750. So this is 1947. Wow. We're looking at at least 750 employees for Lebanon. So you come to get your paychecks. There's your number.
So going back to the fire brigade. So we've got them doing the drill with the hoses. Now we're going to start moving into some of the logging camps that were out um, in the Milano Valley. Just referring to this as Cascade Plywood. <coughs> so that's who con so that's who contracted out the photos. Is that from your records from John Egan? <coughs> they are very nice. Yeah. Definitely yeah. And so most of these photos that we're seeing like this, um, they came from the original negatives. May have never been printed. <coughs> They likely used one or two for a promotional piece, uh, and then the negatives went to a filing cabinet and disappeared for 60, 65 years. Uh, and then they were brought out, they're just a big box of original negatives, large uh, two by two negatives, and then I was able to go in and photograph them or scan them all in. So what's interesting about all of these photos that we're seeing, the original negatives are so high quality, every one of these photos can be blown up this big at full resolution. So that back then, those negatives, again, they weren't cheap. Um, they weren't easy to process, and they yield incredible quality. Excuse me, were those glass plates? or? or these were not glass so plates. Luckily, they weren't. Yeah, glass plates break really easy. <coughs> Um, and, and so part of this, this was 1940, late 1946 to 1948. There were uh, about 25 boxes of negatives. Eleven and Express was only given one. The others were taken either to the uh, museum in Sweet Home or put in other people's <clears throat> private collections. It's just a little box with yellow envelopes and a bunch of negatives inside. So there are about 24 of these missing that have 10,000 incredible photos chronicling Lebanon's history earlier and later. This just happens to be one year. Uh, the yearbook photos were in here. So if you look in the 1947 or 48 yearbook, I've got an envelope labeled yearbook photos, advertising photos, 
and those are direct uh, link to why that's who contracted them. The yearbook advertising team hired Egan to come out and do the yearbook photos. But working for the newspaper, I knew they existed, but we only got one box. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the wood plywood mill. Yeah. 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 It's okay, they have a fire team. They do, they do, they're great. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And I know safety was high priority back then, but I'm guessing in order for them to go through the effort to wrap it, that those were really, really hot. Bowling team. 
Uh, so this bowling alley is in the parking lot of Wells Fargo Bank. So where the Wells Fargo Bank parking lot is, is where the bowling, this bowling alley was. They had a ice cream. Oh, yeah. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker ice cream. Johnny and Rita Walker. Yeah. And I like to show these even though they get a little repetitive. Uh, we've had people recognize family members. I was just going to ask that. There have been, yeah. They people recognize some of the people in the photos. Action photos from 1947. It's amazing. And there's the end. So that is about 130, 140 <coughs> photos. On the back table, I have copies of all the photos that we showed today. Uh, any of those, take them. I went and made copies. Part of the photography side of this is making sure that the photos are seen and that they exist. A lot of these photos, there's only one or one negative. When it's gone, it's gone forever. So every presentation I do, I always print copies of everything, hopes that people take them, put them away, because in 30, 40, 50 years, that may be the only copy that ever exists again. So on the back table, if you want them, take them. Uh, if not, I leave them here, and the library does something with them every time. Um, again, take some time to come up here and flip through some of the books. The Lebanon Centennial. Uh, again, my newest piece is the Crown Zellerback 100 Year Anniversary. The newspaper has some articles in it um, and some photos here. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Yep. I, one of the reasons I came here tonight was to try to get information on two mills. Okay. And um, if you're Lebanonite, you know the Scroggins you know, I mean, the Scroggins D and C. Once upon a time, there was a Scroggins mill. Okay. And you're looking at three first world war. Okay. And <clears throat> anybody knows the location. The location. I, anybody familiar with it? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Um, as far as when it comes to photographs, again, anything pre-1930, the process of photography was extremely complicated. Whereas when someone would go out, they would take maybe one photo. Um, and so a lot of people want to know why there aren't photos of this or that. That's the reason. Pre-1930, very expensive, very complicated, and usually we'll only see photos of bridges, <coughs> schools, hospitals, um, and other big landmarks. One, one, other, one other question about another mill. There was a mill at, the, at um, Milton and um, Williams at yeah, one yeah. time. Does anybody know the name of that mill? Or anybody know the name of that mill? Have you ever asked any of the McPherson family? I, 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 I'm, getting, I'm getting together with um, uh, either Jerry or Phil. Future. I've got some pictures of what I think is their dad's you know, or at least way the mill on. Yeah, that, um, that yeah. could be it. Yeah. And um, are you aware that there was a mill, Lebanon Lumber, where the school district office is now on 5th Street? Yes. Really? My dad worked there at, the, at Sawyer and talking about safety things. Um, my family lived on West Sherman. Uh, off of 5th Street. And so it wasn't very far to walk over and meet my dad for getting lunch. <clears throat> He'd go home for lunch. And I would walk through that mill site with all the stacks of lumbers and the machinery and everything and climb up the stairs to go where the big saw was. And then there was a mill pond 
and my brother worked on that mill pond. Uh, you may have some little family pictures, uh, and I think you know a lot of people in town may have family pictures. Of very, very, very likely. What time frame was that? Uh, the 1935 to uh, 50. Yeah, and then so I do have like yeah, the Spencer. Like Houston Walters. Yeah, I do have photos of the Spencer Cannery. Yeah, um, that was across. The that was across. The the yeah, yeah. So I do have photos of that, but not of um, the one that you're speaking of. I have a bunch of copies of pictures from the McPhersons, uh, logging pictures, some back. Oh, like 1920, I think, in that era. And I have some pictures of the sawmill, which was right behind where Safeway is now. Yeah. And I've got a photo of the McPherson Mill up in the front there in Frank. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a mill on uh, Oak Street, which was the second, third, I would guess, called, I think it was Sewell Mill. Came down 
in the back of their, uh, their mill where they brought logs down. And he was basically did that one as his first job. So that would probably make it in the 1930s. They were still out in the Portland area. I think one of the pictures I have references Jack Trick, which is just a little ways up Upper Berlin. And, and, and I, I'm not familiar with yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, that's all I have. Thanks for coming. Take photos up there. Hold on. Oh, oh, oh. I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank Jeff. And let's give him a round of applause. Some of these people that came in the audience that had information and uh, know about the mills, remember the mills, it's really cool. Uh, one of the things I want to mention to you, one of our board members is Wayne Reeskamp. I don't know if you know Wayne Reeskamp. He's a city councilor. Uh, he got injured uh, the other day in a really bad accident with his eye, uh, and so he's had to have surgery. He couldn't come tonight, but he really wanted to come because he worked in the mills for something like 30 or 40 years, up until they closed. So it was really neat. It would have been neat to have his perspective, and it's nice to have him on our board, too. So thank you again so much. Grab some literature, take a look at the pictures, and have a great night. Thank you.